What a joy to be here with you all. What a great church this is. This is so stunning. You know, everyone is so wonderful and staff being so kind and good. And then when I prayed for them, they all screamed. I mean, it was really good, you know. <laughs> we had a great time. And uh, so it's just great joy to be with you. And uh, I want to share something that's a, a very powerful message. And uh, over the course of many years, I've had to let the Lord work in my own life and bring transformation in my own life. If you want to carry the life of God, you must embrace letting God change you as well. And we never arrive, it's an ongoing journey. And uh, I'm still growing, still learning, and still in loving the ministry, just awesome. And so I've been doing this for many, many years. And I got involved in deliverance ministry in an unusual way. I just was a very young Christian and we went, uh, a school teacher actually, in a small town. And we, we got into a schoolhouse to stay there. And uh, about the second night there, I went to bed and, and uh, my wife was asleep. And suddenly this dark figure walks into the room and I just see this demonic appearance in the room, absolutely terrified me. And I remember freezing, I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe, and uh, all, I couldn't speak, and all I could do was cry at Jesus in my head. Apparently that was enough. And my wife woke up, she started praying, and, and then I realized there is a very real spirit world, and if that's real as I've just experienced, God is more real and more powerful. And I just need to get a line so I can experience more. And that started us on a journey. And so I just got into it and I didn't know what to do. I just got praying. And so I taught physics and math. So I thought, well, I'll just pray. The Lord said, go into your classroom every day and pray and take authority over the spirits that trouble people and then release the peace of God and release um, success into the, school, into the classroom. And so over a period of time, uh, we had many, many things change. And what happened was I had a, had a teacher come in and she said, what's up with your room? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it's really different, this room. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I do a study class around the school, but when I come here, it is really peaceful. Everyone gets work done, so do I. Why is it like that? I just said, hey, you don't wanna know. <laughs> now she pressured me and pressured me. I had to tell her. And I said, well, I just take authority in Jesus' name over all the demons and subdue them and release the peace of God into the room. There it is. And I, I said, I told her, I told you you wouldn't know the answer, and, but you know, you've already told me it's working. So how about that? And then I was there and I had uh, two girls go by and and they stood outside the door and they said, hey, Sue, what's up with your room? And I said, what do you mean, what's up with the room? She said, well, every time we go by, we shake. I said, shaking? I've never seen shaking. Come on in, let me see shaking. So, <laughs> so they came in and sure enough, they're shaking like crazy. And, uh, and I realised then they've been involved in the occult. And so what's in them is manifesting every time I go past my room because my room's full of the presence of God. Even though I wasn't conscious of it, I got used to living in that environment. And, and they were manifesting in that environment. And so, you know, I got really bold. And I said, well, there's the presence of God. You get a bit of boldness on you, you know, and but the presence of God is here. And you girls have been involved in the occult, haven't you? I said, yes, we have. And I said, well, what's in you is demonic, it's reacting. And then I went over the edge. I just went a little too far. I said, I can stop that. And, I, and while I'm even saying it, I'm thinking, I've never seen shaking before. How do you know I can stop it? And they said, okay, do it. And <laughs> so, you know, you've got to, with the Holy Spirit, if you'll just trust Him and walk with Him, He's our teacher, He'll help you. So I, so I prayed two prayers, one they never heard, and that went like this, help, look what I do, you know. And uh, the other one was what I did. And, uh, and, and, and the other one was just very simply, I take authority over you in Jesus' name, be quiet. And they just stopped shaking like that. And then we led them to the Lord and we started to have a move of God in the school. Isn't that something? We had lots of young people get delivered, set free of all kinds of tormenting things. And we need another generation that'll rise up and do that now. This is your time and your turn. You gotta do it. Okay, well, that's all a distraction. Let's go and have a look at Malachi 4. I wanna get to the message I'm gonna share about. Uh, over the years, I've done a lot of work with people and, and a little has done work in my life too. And I found this very common issue keeps turning up all the time. So much so that I changed quite a bit of what I did. So I'd always make sure when people come for ministry, we always check out this foundational issue. So if we just read in the book of Malachi, chapter four, verse five and six. 
And uh, this is the last stage of the Old Testament, the last uh, written prophetic word in the Old Testament. And then there's a gap. And then the next is John the Baptist arrives and then Jesus comes and Jesus reveals the plan of God and, and of course dies on the cross. So Malachi 4 verse 5, he said, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So when you read through there, it's talking about something that's to come in the end times. He said, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That is referring to the conditions that'll exist in the earth just prior to Jesus' return. And so it'll be a great and dreadful day, the day of His return. Great for some, dreadful for others. But it says that before that, there will be a condition in the earth that is so serious that God says, I will pour out or I'll, I'll send Elijah the prophet. So I'm gonna have a look at the first the condition and then why Elijah the prophet. So notice here he says, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. So what he's saying is there will be a breakdown in families that will be global. There will be an issue of a hardening of the heart and the natural affection that should exist between fathers and their children would be replaced by coldness and hardness and anger and addictions and various other kinds of things. And then the natural love and honour that should come from children to their parents would be replaced with anger and rebellion and bitterness and, and uh, all kinds of substitutes for what would be a healthy life. So in other words, they're very serious. And, uh, and Timothy writes the same thing. He talks in the last days, perilous times, people will love themselves, be disobedient, and a whole range of things. So we realise then in, in, in the Scripture, at the end of the age, before the return of the Lord, there will be a situation where there's massive breakdowns. So if we were to look at the statistics uh, in, of families and the marriage breakdowns and fatherless homes, we'd see it's very, very widespread. Why does he say fathers, not mothers? Fathers and mothers? The reason he says fathers because in the Bible, if a family didn't have a father, they were considered to be orphaned. The father was the protect. The word father means a source, source of protection, identity, provision, uh, protection, guidance, discipline. So a father, the biblical meaning of a father is a source of what we need and especially a source of identity. Think about that. And so if you remove fathers, you'll always have a generation that struggle with identity. If fathers are abusive or they fail to be a father, they're either passive and withdrawn or they're aggressive and addicted or whatever, then there's going to be a deep impact on the children that requires the intervention of God. It's not just counseling will help, it requires the Spirit of God to transform hearts. So most religion focuses on outward behavior, do this, do that, dress like this, dress like that, that kind of thing. But, but the Holy Spirit or God always addresses our heart. The heart, the Bible says, guard your heart, Proverbs 4.23, with all diligence, out of your heart flow the streams of your life, the expressions of your life, and also the boundaries of your life. So what's happening in your life is not as much related to where you've come from or your education or anything. It has related very much to the belief structures and the pain and the wounds and bitterness and various other things you carry in your heart. So if you wanna change someone, you don't try to tell them to stop doing things, you help them to deal with the issue of the heart. The Bible says uh, in, uh, in one place, in 1 Samuel, in verse six, chapter 16, verse seven, it says, man looks on the outward parents and the stature, but God looks on the heart. So when God sees you, He's concerned about your heart condition. So you could be building a good, respectable life outside, but your heart condition is in serious state. So he's saying he will send the spirit of Elijah before the great and coming. And so God wants to bring a revival that turns your heart. So the hearts of parents turn towards their children and the hearts of the children turn towards their parents. In other words, that issues of the heart are removed and replaced with honour. And that's the key thing, as we'll come to that in just a moment. And so, of course, hearts are affected in many ways. And, and uh, a parent, parent, parent that's been abusive, a parent that's absent, a parent that's passive, all of these things create consequences in the family. 
So when I work with marriages, I always start with the man. Hey, why do you start with the man? Well, because in an organization, if the organization's going wrong, you go to the top. The person at the top's always responsible. God has put men to be head in their household, meaning to protect the household and to cultivate the environment for it to be healthy. And when they fail, the impact they are responsible for. So you have to deal with that and bring a transformation of heart. You're all getting real quiet now, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> so when you, when you have failure with fathers, then you have, so when you find father failure and then broken families, you'll find, if you look at the statistics, increased poverty, financial lack, uh, increase, uh, if it's young men, they go to jail. If it's a young woman, they tend to get pregnant. Increase of addictions, increase of crime, increase of all kinds of things. Because pain in the home doesn't just stay there. You carry it into your life and relationships and you try and control, manage it, medicate it, do whatever you can, but it'll always leak out into life. It'll always leak out in all your relationships. That's why God wants to deal those things family or father and mother are meant to together express what God is like to people. And so the man expresses certain characteristics of God, uh, and the woman expresses different characteristics of God, and together they help us form a idea what God is like and prepare us to be able to engage with God. So if that's dysfunctional, then we get a distorted view of God. And if we've got issues that are unresolved with a the parent, then we have issues with God. And so many people, for example, they come and they, they give their lives to Jesus Christ, they get saved in that sense. But then when it comes to relating to God as a father, they can't because there's too much pain, too much anguish, too much distress. They can't even use the word without feeling angry. And so trying to relate intimately with someone and you've got anger at the name of the word, you can't build an intimate relationship. And Jesus said that this is life or eternal life, that you have an intimate relationship with God the Father. So how can you become a son, a daughter, representing your father if you've got blocks to being intimate with him? And so I found that people really need help to deal with the blocks to intimacy with God. So they have a prayer life, but they're not intimate. They pray, but never engage. They read their Bible, but don't have revelation. You understand? There's, there's, you can go through the motions of church activities and behaviors, but never have a heart that engages God because there's too much pain and blocks. And when it comes to an intimate relationship, your heart is closed up. And of course, you carry that everywhere. So notice he said, I will send Elijah the prophet. Now, why Elijah the prophet? Why not Moses the prophet? Why not Samuel the prophet? See, why not David, who was also a prophet? Why Elijah? See, now, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because when, when, when he's not gonna send Elijah, he's gonna, the anointing that was on Elijah will be manifested in the last days because of what Elijah did. It's the same movement of the Spirit. So what was Elijah involved in and what was he called to do? Well, Elijah existed in a time in Israel's history where King Ahab, who was responsible for the nation, appointed to lead the nation and keep them in God so it would be blessed in order to gain wealth and influence, formed a political alliance with the Sidonians by marrying Jezebel. Jezebel was the daughter, she was a princess, she was the daughter of the king of the Sidonians, and he was a high priest of Baal and Ashtoreth or Astarte. So, so she's a servant of these false gods. And Baal and Ashtoreth were problems to Israel all the way through its history. They would continually come under the influence of these gods and then go into idolatry and sexual perversion and corruption and God would have to rescue them out of it. And so the, the fact that the patterns keep repeating tells us one, that they never learned well and two, they are slow learners, you know. And, uh, and, and, but the other thing is it tells us this is a very real spiritual power and it's present in every generation to seduce the generation. And so when you look at Jezebel, 
A lot of people got weird ideas. I think it's just a woman. No, Jezebel was a woman, but it's she become the channel to express the nature of two demonic beings, Baal and Ashtoreth. And we just, so people call about the spirit of Jezebel, but it actually, it's the influence of demonic powers through the worship of those gods. Now, in both of these situations, we particularly take, say, Astarte, she was known as the goddess of, of uh, love and war, both male and female. She was known as the goddess that turned men into women and women into men. In other words, her whole dynamic nature was to transform identities so people never became the representative of an image of God, to destroy the image of God in humanity. And it's still at work today. So behind what you're seeing in our culture in the West, the rise of transgenderism, the rise of homosexuality, or rise of all these things, all of these are not new. They are present in the Bible right back through the history of Israel. And they're there to give us a warning. You're not just dealing with a cultural phenomena, you're dealing with spiritual powers that are operative and active because nations have rejected the standards of God. Well, that went quiet. And so what, what, several things that that, that that spirit power did, when Jezebel got in charge, she replaced the worship of God in spirit and truth. She replaced it with a substitute, entertainment and gods that were no gods at all. She destroyed the prophets. In other words, shut down all prophetic voices and raised up her own prophets, the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal bought a message that's coming through the media today. They are the modern day prophets of Baal giving a message that is contrary to the Word of God. Ooh, you're really getting quiet now. <laughs> and if you, if you look, well, I, could, I, I won't go on to that, I wanna get on to where I'm going, but I'm just throwing a few things out for you to get you thinking, see? Just so you can see, when it says, I'll send the Spirit of Elijah, there's, it's a reason God had was saying that and not the others, because of the specific uh, assignment Elijah had. So when you look at Jezebel, she surrounded herself with men who were eunuchs. They had lost their masculinity, their ability to give leadership in their homes and families. This is a big issue. In 50, 60 years, there's been an erosion of the role and distinctives of men and their role in leading their families. And there's been an, an erosion of the role of women and a distortion of both. So people are confused. And so God, we've got to return back to what God has to say in His Word. So Elijah's assignment, and so, so she introduced sexual perversion right through the nation and literally destroyed generational legacy. So there's many things. I won't go into all of that, but here's the thing. God raised the spirit of Elijah. What was the mandate or assignment on Elijah was to turn the hearts of the nation back to God because in turning them back to God, then their hearts would turn to their family. Do you understand that coming back into an intimate relationship with God should overflow to affect marriages and families? In other words, to transform the family, we transform the focus of our heart and bring it back onto God and on the order that God has for our lives. So when I work with couples, I, I try to get them, each of them, to own their journey with God and, and to start to align their lives with the kingdom of God. And then that makes it possible to come into alignment within the marriage. Otherwise, you just, you, you're just wasting time. And uh, it's, it's a big problem. So, so the ministry of Elijah was to call the nation to repent of substitutes for God and to turn back with one heart to God. And so when he built an altar, the fire of God came on the altar, the nation turned, and there was a significant move of God in the nation. And uh, so that's the kind of thing we're dealing with now. The nation needs its heart turned back again. And that starts with individuals. And it doesn't matter where you've come from, it doesn't matter what family background you had, it doesn't matter how much pain there is or difficulty or destruction, God is calling you to change that legacy. You're the one chosen to end the dynamic and build something different. You know that? Okay. So now if you, if you move over then into the New Testament, we pick it up in Ephesians chapter six and verse two, it says, uh, it gives instruction, it says, 
honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And the promise is that it may be well with you. So if there's dishonour, withholding, a heart that's shut down or angry or bitter, then these things won't happen to you. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So you notice then, it tells us that God calls us to honour. Now this is one of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given to the children of Israel on the mountain uh, when God appeared before them and introduced them into covenant. And introducing them to covenant, when you covenant, God says, I will be your God, you'll be my, my people. In marriage, I will be your husband, you will be my wife. But when they enter into covenant with God, then there's commitments we make to honour that relationship. And so the Ten Commandments are not just rules to keep. They are the undertakings, how you have a relationship with God who is invisible. These give you the outlines of that covenantal relationship. Right? So that's why I, it annoys me when couples come and they want to get married and they come up with the stupid promises and stuff. Just ridiculous. I tell them it's just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And if you, you are coming into covenant and, and each of you in your promises is bringing into the covenant something you're undertaking to give. Therefore, don't make it all messy and emotional and silly nonsense. And make commitments of what you will bring to this person. Make commitments what you'll bring to this person. It's not an emotional thing. This is a covenantal relationship for life. You get the idea? That's what this is about. So, so when God's saying, honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, God is saying, it's so important to do this. I've attached a promise to it. There's no promises made to the other ones, but this one has got a promise on it. And the promise, and, and in other words, God's saying, I want you to keep it. Your father and mother are the sword, the door through which God brought you into existence, into the physical world. So regardless of their circumstances, how it happened, whether they wanted you, didn't want you, God was behind it bringing and ushering you into the earth through that channel. And you say, well, it was so bad, it's awful, and why did it, and hate Him for doing that. No, 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 no. It's just, you see, you end up fighting God. God had a plan and purpose for your life. And He knew exactly what nation you'd been born in, what time and era and history you'd be born in, what kind of family background, all the issues that were there. He chose you with an assignment. And if there's bad stuff in the back, you, you, you're to, one of your assignments is to bring an end to all the generational bad stuff and start to build and establish something different for the next generation. Huh? That's what that's about. So that's why there's a promise. And the promise is attached to honour. The word honour means place a value upon, place some weight upon, uh, treat with respect, consider someone to be valuable. So honour is the culture of the Kingdom of God. Honour is a gift. You don't give it to people because they deserve it. Most people, when they think that way, oh, I don't deserve it, I'm not gonna honour them. Well, really, you're not understanding how you walk with God. The Kingdom of God is built on the principle of honour. Honour releases what people have to give. Dishonour shuts them down and distances them. So even Jesus, it says He was anointed with the on measure with the Holy Spirit, did mighty signs and wonders. But when He came to His hometown, He could not do any mighty work. Why? Because of dishonour. So dishonour can stop what you have functioning. It can it causes feelings of rejection, of lack of value, and therefore there's no overflow of what the person has to contribute. So one of the things that we do in life, when you start to learn uh, about the Kingdom of God, we understand that to come into the presence of God, you come in with honour. Jesus taught it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed or honoured is your name. We honour your name. We honour who you are. So access to God comes through faith and honour. Honour is the expression that opens the way for God's blessing to flow to us. It's a principle. So when you come in prayer, in your prayer, when you come in your prayer time, don't come with a whole list of needs. What's all that? What is all of that? That's not honour. That's coming like a beggar telling, oh, he knows all your needs. He wants you to build a relationship where you value Him, respect Him and honour Him. And then out of that relationship, provision flows. 
So it's true in every arena of life where you're honored, you flourish, where you're dishonored, you wither and you need to withdraw and find another place. Unless you're in marriage covenant, then you've got to work it out. <laughs> Which is where we get to now. <laughs> so, so honour. So dishonour means to treat lightly. Trivial. <sighs> She's annoying me. You know, <laughs> it, it's to treat someone as trivial, to treat them like a vapour. It's to basically look down upon. So dishonour is a heart condition. You first dishonour someone in your heart, then you treat them badly. If you treat them badly, it's because you dishonoured them, took away value from them as a person in your heart. Now, God places value on us. Jesus was criticised for honouring people that didn't deserve it. So in Luke 15 and about verse 2, it says, And all the sinners and the tax collectors. So in Jesus' day, there were tax collectors, they were the baddies, and the rest were all just sinners. Everyone's just banded together. The bad ones are the tax collectors. Yeah, we don't like them at all. So, so that's why. But he said, he welcomed them, he received them, accepted them, welcomed them, and then he sat down to eat dinner with them. And in, in, the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew culture, to have dinner with someone is to honour them. And so the Pharisees were outraged because they don't deserve it. The prostitutes, the drug addicts, the homosexuals, the people who are impoverished and, poor, and, 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 and all kinds of issues, they don't deserve it. So they shouldn't get it. See, you understand your thinking? That's what religion does. You do stuff if people deserve it and you withhold it if they don't deserve it. But that's not how the kingdom operates. That's not how we represent our Father. He's kind to the just and the unjust. If you wanna be one of His sons, you learn the principle of honour and you place value on people. You listen to them, you hear them, you value them and they open up and whatever's going on in their life starts to come out. You want to build relationships, honour people, value people, thank people, appreciate people. You'd be amazed. You go to a checkout and they have people come through and they're abusing them through the day. You go to a checkout and smile and look and read the girl's name or the guy's name and use their name and thank them and appreciate them. They light, face lights up. They're suddenly doing everything they can. Now, can they give you an extra bag? On? Thank you. It's just honour. It's the principle of honour and dishonour. And so in the realm of the spirit, dishonouring your parents has serious consequences, serious stuff. It actually creates cycles of failure in your life. Honour, then it may go well for you. Dishonour, it doesn't go well and you can't figure out why. So I had one young man and he came and, uh, and he had, uh, he came up with a word of knowledge and uh, he had a pain in his shoulder and it turns out the Lord spoke to me, he has a spirit of infirmity, he's bitter against his father. So now that, notice the connection, infirmity, a spirit, demons and dishonour of his father. And so I, I said to him, how do you get on with your dad? And he said, oh, I love my dad. I'm thinking, here, yeah, where do I go to from here, Lord? You help me now. <laughs> And, uh, and the Lord said, oh, I said, oh, he travels a lot, doesn't he? He said, yeah, how'd you know that? And uh, I said, well, uh, you know, God wants you. I, I said, the Lord showed me that he travels a lot and he's never been there for you when you want him to be there for your successes and you become angry and bitter at him. And that's why you've got a spirit of infirmity. I said, are you willing to forgive him? He said, I certainly will. He forgave him, released forgiveness. He re broke his agreement with bitters and bitter judgments of his dad. And then when I prayed, he was immediately set free, not only of his shoulder, turns out there was pain right through his body. Everything was healed. How about that? Whoa. Okay. And so I, lots of stories. Let me just keep moving on. I wanted to share with you then just some things in the Bible of the consequences of dishonour. How about that? So, so you, when you see these scriptures, you want to do a search. They're not there for nothing. There's a reason for them. And, and when you start to look, you start to find, and it's surprising when you realise that there's significant spiritual impact of some of the violations of the laws of God. We think because we don't see an immediate consequence, nothing happened. But I've been around long enough to know that the biggest issue I found when it comes to counselling is help people see the problem here originated back here. And you're now on a pathway and it's affecting your life and your relationships. So I found many men and, and women unable to emotionally connect with their children because they're deeply wounded, deeply hurt, and they've never acknowledged and resolved it. 
They think because they're not angry, violent, or doing something bad, that there's not something in the heart. But the Bible tells us this. It says, you can know when you've passed from death to life because you're able to love and value people. If you can't express love and value to people, you're still blocked. Something's going on in your heart. And then we think we're doing okay because we're not doing bad stuff. But actually, there's no neutral position in the kingdom. There's no neutral positioning. You're either in a place of death or life. There's no middle place. So being, <clears throat> being neutral is not a place of life. You just flop back into the place of death. So for example, it says, uh, it says in Ephesians 4, it says, that him that stole, steal no more. And you think, oh, that's awesome, stop stealing. Now here's the problem with stop stealing. You're still a thief because you haven't changed. You've just stopped your behaviour, but your heart hasn't shifted. See, so why does the thief steal? Because first of all, he's got an orphan mentality. I'm on my own. I've got no one to provide for me. I've got to provide for myself. Secondly, because of the poverty mentality, you've got what I want. I feel envious of it. I'm going to take it. That's what moves the thief. Okay, so... You've got, so it says, rather let him work with his hands that he may be able to give to him as need. So God's remedy to being a thief and stealing is that you come into relationship as the father provider and you work and expect the blessing of God to be on your hands to position you so you can give. So you, you didn't stop being a thief when you stopped stealing. You haven't shifted. You've just stopped the behavior. It's when your heart has shifted and now you're into generosity. Now you've changed. See? So, so and the thing is, so when it says honor your parents, if you're dishonoring them, stopping the dishonor is not where it ends. You haven't really changed. You've just contained behavior. You see? But God's not into that. He's into changing hearts. So you need the Spirit of God to access your heart, uncover what's really going on and shift your heart so you're free of anger and bitterness and judgments and resentment and you can actually give it as a gift. And you say, well, what if they're this and that? It just got nothing to do with it. This is who you are now. You're a son and you, you honour. That's how you do life because that's what God calls us to be. If you're not like that, then what are you doing? You're into trading and trying to negotiate. If you do this, I'll do that. That's not how the kingdom works. Okay, so, so let me give you a couple of scriptures then and uh, then we'll give you some ways to get free. So in Deuteronomy 27, 16, it says, cursed is the one who treats his father or mother with contempt. Cursed, how about that? They're cursed. So what is a curse? Well, a blessing means that the Holy Spirit is energising success in my life. I got a tailwind. Cursing, demons are operating to resist me and frustrate me and give me a headwind everywhere in life. And so when people have got a cursing in their life, they're usually frustrated and angry. Because no matter what they do, it doesn't quite work. Just when they should work, it fails. That's what a cursing looks like. So it tells us then that if we treat our mother and father with contempt because they're broken, they're behaving badly, they've got this or they've got that, it's the issue in our heart is gonna cause the problem in our life, not what they did. It's your reaction to it. Oh, suddenly the air sucked out of the room. <laughs> Okay, so next one, Leviticus 20 verse nine. Everyone who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Whoa. Whoa. So what does it mean to curse? Well, to curse means to speak negatively or wrongly or wish harm upon them. So whenever you speak badly about someone and wish they should get what they deserve, when you're thinking that way, you're cursing them when you speak. You're invoking demons to bring destruction. And the Bible says there's a death penalty associated with it. So you just got to think that one through a little bit. Did they actually kill people for doing that? There's no record I found of it happening. So what was the deal of it? God is trying to say it is so important that you don't do that to your parents, that if you do do it, the Bible is warning us then that a spirit is released and activated against us that brings death. Now, not necessarily physical death, although possibly, but emotional death and coldness and separation. In other words, the spirit of death I have found to be attached to people who have bitterness and trauma in their life and they've never resolved it. And so they always are lonely, even in a crowd. They're disconnected even in a crowd and they can't open their heart 
even with people that care about them because something has attached to them to shut them down. And so that separation and inability to feel things is the evidence of that spirit operating. Here's another one, Proverbs 20, 20, whoever curses his father or mother, his lamp will be put into darkness. So a lamp is usually a picture prophetically in the Bible of revelational insight. So what it's saying then is you won't have any insight to the problems you have when you are involved in cursing your parents. You will have problems in your marriage and with your children, but won't be able to work out why, nor know what to do to fix it, because you can't see. There's another scripture like that in Proverbs 30, verse 17. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley or the demons will pick it out. In other words, what he's saying is, you just can't see why you're having problems because you're blinded by what's in your own heart. When you judge people, you can't see clearly anymore. In John, 1 John 3, it says, if you hate your brother, then you are a murderer. It said, who hates his brother walks in darkness and cannot see what he's stumbling over. So if you were to be put in a room with darkness and you start tripping over things, you can't see why you're hurting your feet and hurting your knees. You can't see what you're tripping over. And so what he's saying is that when we dishonor our parents or we curse our parents or we harbor bitterness and hate and reactions towards them, then there's this area of our life is in darkness. Not all of it, but there's an area of our darkness. So where's the area? Everywhere you are in family relationship, that's where it is. And with authorities. And so I find that people who have issues with authorities in their life, at whatever level, and they don't understand the kingdom, and they've got they're, they're empowered by the dishonor and res- resistance in their heart. So the problem is that bitterness is a root; it goes right into the heart. You know, Hebrews twelve fifteen says uh, it talks about not falling out of the grace of God. The grace of God is God's power to enable you to overcome the hurts and issues of life, and to do what God wants you to do grace of God. It's not permission just to be do whatever you want. It's, it's actually power to overcome things, power to become a child of God. It's the power of God to get you through it. So, so it says, don't fall out of the grace of God because when you fall out of the grace of God, you haven't got the power of God to help you. So now you become bitter and twisted and distorted. And when people are bitter, it shows on their face. You hear it in their mouth. They're negative. They complain, all kinds of stuff. So, so don't let any root, a root that is, is like the bitterness is a root in your heart that defiles the relationship, just poison, it flows out and you become twisted inside. And when people are bitter, they become negative and cynical and critical and it gets worse as they get older. There's no joy, no joy in their lives. You tell them something good, oh, I don't know, not so, you know, next, you know, what, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you happy? Why have no joy here? Why can't you celebrate when someone has a, a breakthrough? Yeah. Can, you, can you get it? When people are bitter, it, it, but then it poisons the relationships as well. So when people are bitter, they usually form a judgment. Bitter judgments. In other words, a judgment, a general conclusion based on experiences with one person. So those can be like, you know, men. You know, so a person has an issue with their father. Ah, uh, Well, all men will abandon you. You can never trust a man. Now that's a judgment against all based on one. See? And yet there's a real hurt there, there's a real pain, Dad abandoned us, I'm aching and I'm hurting, and then I form the conclusion and judgment that all will do that. Now I'll attract into my life those people who are like that. Because that's the one I'll feel, feel familiar with. Well, you're getting quiet now. We haven't got time to talk a lot about that, but, but that's a bit of, or it could be against your mother. Perhaps the mothers are very critical and very sharp. And, you know, some people can cut with their words, you know, and or give the look. Everyone, man knows the look. And, uh, but it can hurt. It, it's, it's a sharp criticism. So you could form a, a, a judgment in your heart. Well, all women are critical. All women will, uh, will, will criticise me. And once you've got that, then you formed a judgment against all because of one. And then that means you're gonna have problems in your life, you just reap what you've judged. And usually when we, make, when we make judgments like that, we cover them or protect ourselves with a vow or a promise, I will never, I'll never be like my father. I'll never marry anyone like my dad. 
You understand those vows are the expression of a heart that's a bit of bitter judgment and dishonoring of the Father. You focused on the weakness and, and dishonored Him in your heart. It'll have a consequence. And then uh, it could be that uh, the person formed in a vow. Well, I'll never marry my mo- anyone like my mother. I'll never be like her. You, you've set in a pathway down because she's your emotional focus and you've judged her. You're going to start to trend towards that. I, I look, you cannot believe how many times, that, I'll give you one story. I had one girl and, she, and they said, can you counsel her? I said, oh, okay. And uh, so they, she said, uh, I said, what's, what's the challenge? What is it you're facing? She said, well, I wanna know whether to marry this guy. And I said, well, who is he? And uh, she told me she'd been in a relationship with him for a while. She broke off with him, got with another guy and, uh, and um, he got pregnant, had a baby, broke up with him. The other guy came back wanting to marry her. Yeah, messy stuff. And uh, I said, okay. I said, well, why'd you leave him in the first place? She said, well, I left him because he was unfaithful to me. I said, how many times? She said, well, three different things, he, people he was unfaithful. I said, well, look at this. I said, he's unfaithful to you three times and he hasn't changed, he hasn't become a Christian, he can do the same stuff. So if you marry him, you're gonna have cycles of this happening and you'll broke up, it'll all blow up, won't last. Now I could see she, she was not listening. And I said, tell me about your dad. And she said, oh, I don't see much of him, I don't really get on with him. I said, why is that? Now that sends the alarm bells off. So why is that? She said, oh, well, he left, he, he, he left, he left my mum when, when, she was, when I was 12. I said, really? Why did he leave? Well, he was unfaithful. I said, really? Unfaithful to your mother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, how many times? Oh, three different women. And I said, oh my. Can you see you are creating in your life and circumstances, it's like you're reaping and recreating in your life the very thing you are trying to run from. You're not free of it. It's in your heart. You've made a bitter judgment against your father. You're angry against him. You've judged him. You've made vows. You didn't marry anyone like him. I said, did you do that? Yeah. I said, well, here's a guy you have just asked you want to marry him. And he's he's done the same thing already. I, I can share lots of stories like that, all the same. And they all have this in common. The person could not see that the problem that's created in their life is a repetition in the very different shape packaging, but of the very issue they judged a father for. They just needed to deal with it and break out of it. There's a story in the Bible which is like that. And that's the story of David and Michael. David and Michael, they were, they were lovers. Uh, he loved her and she loved him. Bible says she loved him with all her heart. She was very, very in love with him. And anyway, um, Saul, her father, became very bitter and jealous of David and so wanted to kill him. So she helped him escape. He gets away. And now Saul sends his soldiers to hunt him down. There's an order out, kill him on sight. And anyone who befriends him, kill them too. So he's a insecure, fearful, and very bitter man. And now he's seeking to kill David and he keeps pursuing him and killing his friends. At the same time he's doing that to David, his daughter, he says, you can consider him dead. He marries her off into another man, to another man who she didn't love, forcing her into adultery. And every night as she'd be in bed with that man, she's thinking of the man she loves, hoping he'll come back and save her. Very heartbreaking story. And he was un, Dave was unable to save her until eventually Saul died. Now, the path and journey of the two of them is a path to bring them where they will lead the nation. David let God work in his heart. He forgave Saul. He continued to honour the office. And when the opportunity was given to kill Saul, he refused it because of honour and respect for God and for those over him. He refused to lift his hand twice. And then God raises him up and restores him and he becomes the king of Israel. Then we look at the other side, Michal, has become embittered against her father because of the abuse by her father, embittered against her husband because she's got these father issues, she's carried it now, and now she's bitter against the man she once loved. So when David is restored and becomes the king, first thing he says is, I want my wife back. Brings her back, but she's not the same. 
She's got a bitter root in her heart, a judgment against not only her father, but against David. And then the next thing David wanted to do was to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city. And so they came and bring the presence of God, was shouting. And it says, Michael looked through the window and despised him. So when you allow bitter judgments in your heart, you become an observer of blessings, but not one who enters them. Your bitterness is keeping you out. See, and then the Bible says, therefore, she remained barren all her life. Now for a woman to be barren meant dishonor and shame. She dishonored her father, and in return, she lived as a woman of dishonor. Barren spiritually, barren in her marriage, barren in her womb, barren socially. Wow. That's high consequence. And the stories are all there for us to see and discover and to realize God wants you to get your heart right, to turn away from bitterness and to honor. And the steps are not hard. We just need to recognize that my heart has been impacted by what I've experienced. And until we recognize it, we'll never change. And come to the Lord and with a repentant heart to confess to Him, Lord, I've made judgments, I've been angry, I've held these things in my heart. Lord, forgive me. And we make the decision to resolve and let go the grief and the anger towards the father, towards the mother. Sometimes writing about it, writing it out, not sending it, but writing it out can help you bring it out. So you let go from your heart. Then break the judgments and make a decision now in whatever ways I can, I will pray for them, I will bless them, I will honour them. You're only free when you can move into honour. You say, well, what if they're, what if they're very abusive? Well, you said boundaries. The issue is one of your heart being able to honour and how you speak about them and so on. So God wants us to move out of dishonour, out of bitterness, out of anger, out of cursing, out of death. And He wants our heart to be free so we can build for the next generation something different. They will look at you and see backwards how you handle that relationship and they will copy it with you. We say, man, why don't we get the musicians up and I want you to open your heart for the Lord to help you. If you're watching online, whatever happens here can happen for you wherever you are. God is in the business of healing broken hearts and He's in the business of setting us free from the things that have entered our life as a result of being hurt and wounded and being dishonoured. However it has happened, God can heal you and set you free. You've just got to position yourself so He can do it. We position ourselves by coming and preparing our heart and saying, God, I'm in pain. I know there's a block. I know there's dishonour. Lord, I'm opening my heart to You. Lord, I repent now of harbouring these things, the anger, the judgments, the bitterness. I just turn away from it and let it go to You. Lord, I'm crying out to You to heal my heart and set me free of the things that have come onto my life. There's some people here, you've been into occult stuff and it, you're in it because you're bitter. You're bitter because of your family situation. You need to just make that decision. I'm really on a bad path. I need to break out of it. Some of you have got involved in pornography because you're in pain and you're rejected. You're struggling with your identity because of a lack of a father or conflict at home, make a decision to cut the ties with that, repent of it and deal with the root cause which is in your heart. There's other people who are struggling with various other forms of addiction. Addictions always can be tracked back to shame and pain. Deal with shame and pain and you disempower the addiction. You can process and work through it much easier. Why don't we all stand together now? We have an opportunity for you to come forward and I want you just to be honest. I want you to be open and let the Holy Spirit help you today. This presence of God came this morning. People were set free. It's gonna happen right now again. People will be set free. We've got powerful ministry team. Have you just come up and when you come up, I want you just to don't focus on anyone. Just close your eyes, open your heart to God and talk to Him about what you're carrying and just let the emotions flow, release it to Him, release it to Him, repent of what you've harried and repent of how you've tried to solve it and forgive. Let the forgiveness flow. And, and when we come to pray for you, God will touch you. Amen. Why don't we do this thing together and worship Jesus. Come on, you come now. Make your way to the front. There's many people now needing freedom. Make your way to the front right now. That's right, come, come, come.
let's ride. Make your way. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's ride. Come. 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 There's many more. Come on, make your way. Many more struggling with rejection. Some of you struggling with depression. Some of you struggling with addiction. Make your way to the front. Make your way to the front. Make your way to the front. Some of you have been abused. Some of you have been abandoned. Make your way to the front. Start to reach out to the Lord. Don't look around. Reach out to the Lord. Come, come, come. There's others need to come. Some of you are struggling in your marriage. And deep down, you know there's an issue with a father, mother. Make your way to the front. Say, God, I want to put it right. If your spouse will come, bring them too. Please come, come. There's many others need to come. That's right, that's right. Come. Open up to the Lord to heal you. Come, come. There's still some others over here. Keep your eyes closed. Closing your eyes helps you become conscious of God. You have a Father in heaven who loves you deeply. As we were worshiping, I could feel the grief that many of you are carrying. I see someone's carrying anger, deep anger, because of the violence. Some of you are really hurt because of what you saw your mother go through. Some of you are hurting because your mother had a breakdown and you've had to carry all the family and you've judged her, judged your father also. You have a father in heaven who understands. Did you know that David was abandoned by his family and he said, when my father and mother abandoned me, the Lord gathered me up. Jesus had troubles with his family too. They said he was mad and tried to bring him home. This is the most painful area. There are many men who just cannot express their emotions because of what they've gone through. My father went through the war, depression, trauma in his home. It affected him. But God raised me to bring an end to all of that. You're the one God's chosen to change the generational pattern. And it starts with you letting God in. Lord, I'm hurting. Help me. The young man and prodigal son in Luke 15 had brought terrible dishonour to his father publicly, shamed him, embarrassed him. His whole lifestyle was outrageous. He rebelled. But when he came back, his father saw him when he was a long way off. He wasn't angry. He was full of compassion. And Jesus said, that's what God is like. He's a father who's compassionate. And the father ran and put his arms around him, hugged him and kissed him and restored him. Your father in heaven does that. It's so offensive to religious people 
that God could be so caring of us. So just right now, just in your heart, put the issues right. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Then I'm going to lead you in a corporate prayer. If you're watching online, you could follow us in this prayer. Corporate prayer. We just pray together so it's fairly general. Then we're going to ask God to come and bring healing and deliverance. And then I want you to worship Him. And as you worship Him, I'll pray a general prayer and then we'll come and lay hands on you. When we lay hands on you, just stop praying and let God touch you. Follow me in this prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. I declare Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. Because of what He did, I am forgiven and I belong to you. I'm a child of God. Lord, I come to you now. I renounce every generational curse that's brought suffering to my family. I forgive my father. I forgive my mother. I renounce all judgments I've made, all vows I've made to protect my heart. Lord, I bring my heart to You now. Heal me. I release all grief to You, disappointment to You. And I ask You, Lord, now to forgive me, to heal me and to deliver me. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. I open up and receive right now.